to make. But first, James, good to be with you again. It's good to be with you as well. <laughs> One of our three week, three times a week uh, gets together. <laughs> yeah. A few announcements. Um, we need to look at those announcements. We will have our community uh, lunch next week, but it's a community bag lunch. Um, and uh, Linda Wickstrom will be leading that with just a, a few people in the kitchen with her uh, keeping safe distance from one another, and those bags are left on the table so folks in the community who need, who need food can come and have a, have a nutritious lunch. We'll, we'll know in the next few days or so um, if the bishop uh, postpones or suspends worship for May or when she um, uh, hopes to um, have us resume um, our sanctuary worship. I imagine she'll be following the guidelines of our governor. With that, we have a, a moment to center ourselves. Yeah, so we begin our time together as a chance to um, relax, to center ourselves, and to uh, bring ourselves to awareness of God's presence with us. So let us uh, take a moment, have a, have a seat, uh, and back straight, good posture, and uh, let's take a deep breath in. And as you breathe in, remind you of the Spirit's presence with you. And exhale any anxiety or worry you may be feeling. Inhale. And exhale. Inhale God's Spirit. As you exhale, sense God's peace with you. Our passage this past Sunday reminded us that Jesus breathed on his disciples and, and gave them the Spirit and spoke words of peace. Inhale one more time. And exhale. Spirit of God, we are grateful that you are present with us, that you are with us when we feel anxious, when we feel worried, and we are grateful for who you are. Help us to be aware of you in this moment, in all our moments. Amen. Amen. Each week I've been, each week I've been writing a reflection, sharing uh, that reflection with you on Tuesday, and then it's posted on Wednesday. It's a way that I can tell you what my thoughts are at this time of, um, of social separation and the coronavirus and a way that we, we can connect. So we'll begin. M my father was not a believer. From time to time he would say to me, his son who became a Methodist pastor, 
On a good day, I'm agnostic, but most days I, I can't even admit to that. We were close in his later years, as much friends as father and son. Even so, it took me by surprise when he told me not long after he was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor that he wanted me to officiate his funeral. Then he dug out of a drawer his baptism certificate dated in 1929 and from a Methodist church in the northern reaches of New Hampshire. He was an infant. I asked him, will I, I do this as a pastor or do I try to put that aside and just be your son? He answered that he wanted me to do for him what I do for everyone else at a funeral. And that's what I did. When family and friends gathered at his gravesite and it was time to say goodbye, I pulled out the pocket edition of the Methodist Book of Services from my suit jacket and began to pray. Oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask. I was careful not to betray my father for what he wasn't, a church-going kind of guy. He wouldn't have stood for that, and neither would family and close friends. I buried the father that I had, the non-believing father I loved. For years, I grappled with why he asked me to do a Christian service. He was not a sentimental person. He wasn't looking for some misguided nostalgia, his clergy son giving him a send-off. He was a businessman who was most comfortable with numbers, facts, and order. Maybe it was with his baptism certificate tucked away in the recesses of his earlier life. He decided in dying he would go back to what was given to him as an infant, despite his reservations and doubts. His cancer prognosis was dire and he needed help. I think it's true that when we've lost control of our lives and uncertainty is the only sure thing we have before us, we reach for God. Or we reach for whatever name we impulsively attach to that cry for help. Recently, a friend asked me how I pray. He's not a church-going sort either. At my age, he remembers staying, attending his Roman Catholic confirmation in early adolescence and then not going back. I think he was imagining that I get on my knees every day holding long conversations with our maker the word, word spilling forth poetic. But the truth is, it's nothing of that sort. Most days, my prayer is simply, Lord, help. As in, Lord, help me, I'm losing my patience. <laughs> or, Lord, help my child, keep her strong and healthy. Or, Lord, help me sleep. It's 3 a.m., and I've got too much on my mind. Lord, help. My prayers, I told him, are of the foxhole sort. He laughed and told me that even he did that much, and evidently, so did my father. But so did Moses when he faced the Pharaoh, Ruth when she was bereft and hungry, David when he was caught in his affair with Bathsheba, Jeremiah when he was called forth to be a prophet, Mary when she learned she was pregnant, and every man, woman, and child who came to Jesus sick, hungry, or in some way broken. Help, Lord, is the most common prayer in ancient times, and it still is. It's what spills forth from our mouths. In these difficult times, pray that prayer, whatever you do or don't believe. God honors that cry for help. And I close with this psalm. In my distress, I call upon the Lord. To my God, I cry for help. For his temple, for his temple has heard my voice, and my cry to him has reached his ears. Amen. Amen. Well, we have asked in the last couple of weeks to send for you to send in letters uh, that you've written, and I have one that I'm going to read from Linda Hussein on her uh, favorite childhood Easter story. I know that uh, Kat said on the live stream that uh, she is working on her letter for where she sees God, so we look forward to that, Kat. And uh, let me read this, but first look at this beautiful handwriting and this uh, rainbow paper. Just want you to see that. All right, so here's Linda Hussein's favorite childhood Easter story. 
I grew up in Southern California in the 1950s. My father had a friend named Mr. Robertson who owned a large date and citrus grove somewhere around um, Indio or Palm Springs in Southeastern California. Our family was invited to spend Easter weekend with them on their ranch. I remember palm trees everywhere and a huge area of orange, lemon, and lime trees all around their single level ranch style home. We arrived on Saturday afternoon. I can remember the excitement of seeing all the different play activities and animals. There was a large tree house not too far from the house. Chickens, ducks, and turkeys were, were scratching, animated around everywhere. The big tom turkeys were totally frightening with their strange blue, pink, and wrinkled skin hanging down around their face. They made a strange loud sound and chased me and my younger brother up into a treehouse where he stayed most of the time and I was terrified of them gobbling after me. My dad said, Linda, turn around and gobble at them and chase them and they will run away. Wow, it worked. I then spent some time entertaining the adults with my turkey impressions, imp impressionistic chasing. After that exercise, Mr. Robertson had a long ramp that went onto the top of the ranch house where all the poultry went up to roost at night. I watched the parade go up the ramp. The ramp was taken down. We were told that way the wild animals and the coyotes couldn't get their birds. I didn't know birds went to sleep on the roof of a house. I can't remember the names of, Mr. of the Robinson daughters. They were around the same age as me at the time, seven or eight. They were very sweet and kind. They showed me their swimming tank, which was a huge cistern that held the irrigation water out of the well. There was a big windmill and barn nearby. On Easter Sunday morning, I awoke to a pretty Easter basket filled with colored Easter eggs and candy. All the family went together to their church. I got to go to the Sunday school with the girls. I remember weaving colored paper into a basket I could keep. After church, there was a big supper of good food. Afterwards, we walked around the ranch and saw more animals. There was a large fence pen with sheep. One of the rams charged my mother when she wasn't looking and knocked her to the ground. She screamed and scrambled out of the pen quickly. They then took us for a ride in a cart pulled by their donkey. He was cute. Too soon, it was time for us to leave. I didn't want to go. I would have liked to stay there and experience more of God's grace, which I wasn't aware of at that young age. The love and kindness stayed with me through the years. Spring, Easter, beauty, new beginnings. I still like to remember the wonder of it all. The visit to the Robertson Ranch impressed me on me. Country living, love of animals, love and care towards others. And for that, I'm grateful. So thank you for sharing that with us, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Uh, we want to close with this passage. It's from Philippians uh, 4, uh, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you all. Amen. Take care now. Bye-bye.